Dave, Kyle, Dr. Shismith, Karunakaran, <laughs> and he's currently an assistant professor of mathematics directly in the Department of Mathematics and Program in Mathematics Education at Michigan State University. Prior to this, he was an assistant professor of mathematics at Washington State University. He received his PhD in mathematics education from Pennsylvania State University in 2014. And the primary focus of his research is in teaching and learning mathematical proving and problem solving at the post-secondary level. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, and I'll start this talk with an apology, uh, which is, so I swear I had a complete talk ready that I got on the plane last yesterday, and I decided to change it. Uh, so this is the title as it stands uh, with all of the information. This is really the t more expanded title of what it's become uh, in the last 24 hours. And part of the reason I made this sort of change is to, one, try to kind of describe this journey. I've, my collaborators and I have been on for the past two or a little over two years with this idea of trying to hopefully bridge multiple fields of neurocognition and cognitive psychology, perhaps and uh, our field of mathematics education. And uh, I figured this is a safe enough room for me to try and pull a stunt like this. Um, so what we're going to talk about, what I'm going to talk about today, is trying to describe this journey from a very methodological perspective. Because I'm not a neuroscientist, I'm not a cognitive psychologist, I don't have formal training in either, which means that there was a lot of trust involved in trying to find collaborators uh, who would, one, stand for a novice like me to be part of this work, and also uh, the desire and the motivation to try and do this intersectional kind of work, uh, or interdisciplinary kind of work. Which actually is where I should start. This kind of is a very collaborative effort, and I should uh, I'm going to talk about three different projects or related studies that we've uh, done and how we developed them. Uh, Milos over at uh, University of Oklahoma, Milos and I originally sort of started talking about this uh, and trying to do this joint project. Um, the guy at the very bottom there is James Whitbread. James is an undergraduate student who's graduating next month. Uh, he was our sort of, he's off to Johns Hopkins for med school uh, in the fall, and so he provided a lot of kind of help with the anatomy and the functions of the brain, and especially to novices like us. Um, Kimberly Fenn is the one in the middle. Kim is a cognitive psychologist and a neuroscientist at Michigan State University. She's currently my uh, main collaborator, and the last work that I'm going to talk about today is a study that we're, project we're starting just now. Um, Abby Higgins is, uh, well, she was my student, now is an assistant professor in the Cal State uh, system. Um, and none of this really would have been possible were enough for this picture. Uh, you, of course, recognize Dave Plaxco. If you can't, that's him cringing on the net. Um, so when I first started thinking about this work at uh, Washington State University, Milos happened to post this picture on Facebook. And it, I was, he's wearing a neural net for an EEG. And that's sort of what I was messing around with at that same time, just pure happenstance, which started this conversation. So I constantly, I haven't told Dave this, but this picture is sort of a big reason how I, this actually, and a side project curiosity for me, ended up being a pretty uh, prominent part of my research sort of trajectory as I'm looking at it now. But moving forward, this is in some ways timely because uh, don't worry about reading all of this. It's just a bunch of text to, as a placeholder to, in 2010, ZDM released a special issue um, that they called uh, they called for looking at the research that lived in the intersectionality of neuroscience and mathematics education. And in there, Grabner and, uh, and Sari sort of 
highlighted this idea that uh, since we have so much more in the last two, now almost three decades, there's been so many advancements in cognitive psychology and neuroscience uh, in trying to understand how the human brain works, it makes sense to try and, as they call it, build bridges between, on the one hand, the cognitive neuroscience of numeracy and mathematics, and the empirical study uh, of mathematics learning and education. So, and this was back in 2010. Uh, it's, it hasn't gone away in the most recent compendium. Uh, Andy Norton and Martha Bell wrote, had a full chapter in uh, the section of the frontiers uh, section, or the future section, about mathematics, educational, neuroscience, and promises, and challenges, and they sort of describe those two challenges, um, which they're very specifically talking about neural imaging. Uh, can we detect neural activity that corresponds to, uh, in one aspect, cognitive demand, on the other aspects, looking at mathematical act actions and representations, how can we find neural correlates to uh, or pictures of the brain while people are trying to understand representations or uh, while people are trying to solve problems with this idea of cognitive load. Um, and interestingly, keeping with the same theme of challenges, in the 2010 special issue, they raised sort of three main challenges. One was, are we, at that point in time, 2010, testing the right set of populations? Um, now, what that means is, for instance, most of the studies historically that have been done with neuroscience and neural imaging and mathematics has been with elementary uh, age children, or even pre-elementary uh, age children. And there are lots of different reasons for this. One is um, the type of mathematics, especially with sort of num understanding of number and uh, simple arithmetic processes were easier to try and isolate and look at, uh, as opposed to com more complex stuff, at least neurally speaking, like proving a mathematical statement, which is sort of where we're trying to go to. Um, so being limited in the types of populations that they're looking at was sort of one challenge. The other, other idea was, how do we actually create experimental design that can work for more complex processes like mathematical proving or problem solving in general. Um, and the, so if we can't bridge that gap as easily, how does sort of basic number processing, for instance, relate to high order uh, mathematical processes? So these were sort of the challenges as outlined in 2010. And what's interesting is they re six years later, so two years back now, they re-released their special issue uh, just in time for the IGME conference in Hamburg, uh, which is where they did this whole panel thing about, so where has, six years have passed, has the field, the intersectional field has moved forward. And it turns out, of course, there are newer imaging techniques, less invasive imaging techniques, for instance. Ideally, you want to put everybody uh, into an fMRI to get sort of deep cuts of your brain, but if you've never seen an fMRI or been in one, you can't do anything, like, and it's so sensitive that you can't talk, you can't hardly blink, because that all adds noise to the readings. So it's very invasive in that sense, and let alone trying to have somebody actually prove something, um, actually moving, or... So there are better techniques, but there's still a disconnect, because a lot of the research is either done very much from a neurocognitive perspective, where mathematics educators have, don't have much role in it, or it's done, obviously, in our world, uh, and this is, I'm talking the majority of stuff, this, there is work that's obviously done in the intersectional uh, area, but, so for the current challenge for us, as we saw it, was we wanted to uh, set our sights on studying more complex mathematical processes, seeing if it was even possible. Um, it, from a logistical perspective, but also from a useful kind of perspective, is it, is it just something novel and cool, or can we actually learn something from this? Um, it was also our challenge that we wanted to make sure that we were representing both fields. So the predominantly quantitative uh, nature of 
cognitive psychology and neuroscience, but also the predominantly qualitative nature of the kind of work that most of us do on a daily basis. So we wanted to make sure that that methodology, those methodologies were represented uh, and used as triangulation for each other as much as possible. Um, and then try to actually use the technological advances to kind of go through this. And this led us to this three studies or projects that we looked at. Um, the first one was relate, related to mathematical creativity or insight. I'm going to speak very, very fast about, mainly because uh, it was the project that Milos and David over at the University of Oklahoma, had, they, it was their project. I was only very tangentially involved when I was at WSU. Um, I'll refer to it, but it's not mine to speak of, so that's, the, but that was one area. The second area was the work that I did at WSU, which was more about cognitive load, uh, trying to see if uh, there was this neural cor correlate to how people respond to or self-report cognitive load, so from the qualitative aspect, trying to talk about how hard a mathematical problem solving or proving task was them, for them, and seeing if the actual um, neural imaging data actually correlates with that or not. And I, in some ways, I understand that most of the questions that I'm going to talk about are at the level of yes or no, do they correlate or don't they, but hopefully the reason I'm doing, uh, we're starting there is because that's where we kind of need to start. Uh, before even answering anything beyond that, we just have to even see that are we hopefully even getting close to measuring what we're hoping to measure. So a lot of this stuff will stay at that yes or no level. And my current uh, work that we're just starting related to general work, um, working memory capacity and general fluid intelligence, and I'll define all of these terms later. Uh, so and this is at Michigan State now. So, as I mentioned, I'll really quickly go through this idea of what uh, Milos and um, David and their colleagues did. This a central question was, can we find correlates to mathematical creativity or insight or the aha moment? So what they did was they asked people to go and prove mathematical statements on their own, not in the lab, uh, just record their work using life red pens. And then they would bring the work back to uh, the investigators, and they would take that work and chunk it into, you can literally think of it as these slides where sort of bite-sized chunks in the order of the work that they produced. So sort of this chronological recap of the work that the people had uh, done. And the goal was, since we can't put people into uh, these uh, fMRI machines or whatever, or even EEGs, which is what they were using, while they're proving, because they're too sensitive to movement or to a speech, can we put them in a scenario where they're essentially reliving the process? So it's if we can't study the process, can we recreate that environment for them uh, using their own work? And as it turns out, um, the very preliminary work, that, the data that came out of it, the results, seem to suggest that when people were actually put in under the EEG and they were given their proofs versus sort of a canned produced proof of something else, so it's just proof validation or comprehension, the aspects of the brain that light up are, are fundamentally different. For instance, if they're looking at canned proofs, the first thing that uh, lit up was the part of the brain that deals with verbal processing, so it's about reading and trying to understand what you have before it moves to the more analytical part of your brain. As opposed to if they're given their own work, the, the switch was almost immediate. And when I'm saying talking immediate and first going to verbal versus analytic, we're still talking milliseconds, but because of the speed of the processing, but um, it's almost that switch of going immediately to the analytic process when they're looking at their own pro uh, proof was encouraging because it seemed to indicate that there was less that they needed to understand about what was in front of them. It was like as for reading them. It's almost like, hopefully, the reliving part. So there was um, sort of some hope in the way that was going. 
our original work with WSU at, at Washington State was to look at cognitive load. So the idea was, uh, again, can we have participants, subjects, in an environment where they're proving something? And when we ask our participants about, uh, in our qualitative task-based interviews perhaps, uh, to prove something or work on a task, there is a sense of, and sometimes we might even ask, and I've done it in studies or in interviews that I've done before, how hard that was that for you? Can you describe what you had to do? And so this idea of self-reporting, of uh, kind of having a self-regulation of, or a metric for how hard was something for me as compared to something else. How reliable actually is that actually? In the sense of, does that actually uh, correlate to the amount of cognitive load that your uh, brain was under while they were actually doing those tasks. So in order to do that, one of our first things, we needed to have a, an imaging uh, system where it wasn't as invasive. And what we uh, used was something called the FNIR, sort of the functional near infrared spectroscopy. And this is what it looks like. It's just a sort of a headband with, um, and all of these emit really high frequency light. Uh, and what this light is basically doing is, this is just over the frontal lobe, so it's not like an entire brain sort of way of looking at an EEG or an F uh, or fMRI. But what this is doing is, the, the light and the way it refracts through the blood at the surface of uh, your frontal lobe, you can actually have a measure of how much it's a proxy for a measure for how much cognitive load your mind is actually in. And what they're, what they're actually looking for is, based on what part of your frontal lobes light up, to use a very, very uh, naive, which is my way of saying it, which part of your frontal lobe lights up, we can, by and large, look at uh, what portion of the brain is doing what, uh, or working more. For instance, and since we're only looking at the frontal lobe, for instance, something called Brodmann's Area 46, apparently we know has to do with uh, attention. Well, what are we immediately paying attention to at any given moment? How much working memory are we using? And this, the, the exact central execu executive function, as in what, do, what happens next? Kind of all of that happens apparently predominantly in that area. Just a quick clarifying. So yeah. like you said how much working memory. So is it the kind of thing where like more of it is lit up than it's like more no, cognitive it's, load or? Uh, no, and that's, this is what we end up looking at. Because what we're really looking at is the light or the measures tell us how much, the presence of how much oxygenated hemoglobin or blood that we have in a given moment versus how much deoxygenated hemoglobin that we have. The difference between these two in when the brain is in an excited state versus when it's not, is the proxy where of how much cognitive load. So your different parts of the brain can actually give higher readings at any given point. Uh, now, the one thing I should very clearly state is, it's not like I can, even though this is, I, I will admit, a little misleading by saying, if I see this light up, I know working memory is doing most of the work. Of course not. That's not as simple as that. And what we were doing was not predominantly saying what sectors of the brain are working more. We're not even close to being there. We're just talking about looking holistically and looking sort of like the combined cognitive load measure, I suppose, uh, in the frontal lobe. So, but in order to do that, I'm gonna skip this really quickly. We had to come up with, um, a lot of this was trying to figure out protocol, experimental procedures. So what we learned was every time they worked on a task, before and after, we have to do what's called baselining, which is quite literally sitting in a dark room, think about your happy place kind of thing. Because you want your, the brain to settle as much as possible before they work on the other one. And we are talking about 10 to 15 minutes each time where they're just sitting, hopefully not thinking about too much. And we can actually, well, I mean, that's the thing. Though. We could actually, it's a, it's a real-time view of what's happening. So one of the other things that happen is 
you, you will never get somebody's, anybody's brain going back to where, like, where you originally started, right? Because, so sequencing of tasks became really important. Uh, because originally we started thinking, so maybe we should randomize these tasks in order, like, uh, according to difficulty, to say that it shouldn't have an order to going from the easiest to the hardest. But it turns out we really should order them. Like our sequences, and this was the order sorry, of the tasks that we gave. So this was the easiest task that they worked on first. Mostly procedural, given alpha, beta, calculate this or prove this, but it was, in, in essence, a calculation. And then we had a pretty classic number theoretic proof. Um, then went to this one, more real analysis, given a sequence with a certain property, prove that it uh, always diverges, the series diverges. And then there was this one, which is, uh, can you prove that a function with these two properties exist? Now, even though this is more or less an increase in difficulty, the way we did it was, this was easily, and this is qualitative task design. Like, when we design these, we make arguments for, or we made arguments for, how this is, qualitatively speaking, the easiest task. This is the hardest task. And this is not where our experiment uh, lies. It's actually with the middle two tasks we were interested in. Because this, it really depended on the person. Uh, and how they would order it. Because we were relatively confident that everybody would put this as the easiest and put this as the hardest. We were more interested in how they ordered these. Just, and they were approximately close enough that we could actually look at differences. And they're going from one task to another every time. So we could try and compare that task to each baseline. Its baseline, not the baseline before. So all we were looking for is the amount of activation from the baseline right before. So. By the way, this took about nine months to figure out, and probably 10 different experiments to figure out that we should be doing this. Mm -hmm. This is also where collaboration came, became really important, because we did not have a neuroscientist uh, sort of as a full-time collaborator when we did this, which when we finally did, that nine-month journey we were on was a five-minute conversation. <laughs> and he just said, Oh, of course that's what you do, mm -hmm. at which point, I don't know, I wanted to have a drink or something. But um, So what we did was that we asked them to um, solve these tasks. They come in, they, we hook them up to the uh, FNIRs. Oh, the other reason the FNIRs was good for us was it's very uh, non-reactive to external noise. What I mean by that is they can move, they can write, they can talk even, because the software that filters everything, actually all of those are considered, considered to be low frequency noise. So you, the software can actually norm those out. So, uh, but the trade-off is it's not as accurate as an fMRI, for instance. So we asked them to do uh, each task in order uh, with the baselining procedure. And then afterwards, we take all the machinery off and we do a qualitative interview, which is uh, we ask them to talk us through what they did. Because while they're working on it, nobody's talking to them. They're just doing what they need to while they're working on these things. But we would ask them, how did you do this? Can you walk us through your solution? Uh, and then the most important thing was we had them do a sorting task, which is can you sort these in the order of increasing difficulty as you feel uh, they might. And with all our participants, one was always the easiest, or was always the hardest, which was good to see. Um, but there was probably about 50% of them did it two and three, or the other one did it. Uh, the other ones did it three and two. And so this is basically sort of give you an idea of think I don't know something 500 odd pages of numbers like this. This is how the data comes out, and these are all differences between oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin for each optode, so there are 16 different sensors in that band, uh, which correspond to all of these O's. Um, and that's why we have negative numbers sometimes, which relate in some of the, at this point during the baseline in this optode or region, there was more deoxygenated hemoglobin than oxygenated hemoglobin. 
roughly what these numbers mean. So what did we all find out while we did regressions and kinds of... There was a correlation. People are actually pretty uh, reliable when it comes to neural data in trying to judge how uh, easy or hard something is for them. And that's the key part. This is just about them. Uh, it's not something about how somebody else would judge it. Uh, so, and this is all initial sort of stuff. Um, I'll sort of breeze through this one because moving forward, the current work, which is sort of in its infancy right now, is we've moved from, one of the problems with neural imaging is we can't seem to solve this problem of we want to have as accurate imaging as possible, but we still want them to be doing the types of problems we want them to be doing. And we can't really find a solution to how to bring those two together. So one of the other things that we've been trying to do is go take a more cognitive psychology perspective to this. So in terms of information processing theory and how perhaps the brain functions in terms of working memory and uh, looking at cognitive load in terms of an actual measure of working memory. And if people have higher working memory capacities, uh, are, do they mean they're uh, maybe more naturally inclined to be able to do more complex problems, let's say? Um, or general fluid intelligence, which we're defining as adaptability, but I'll get to that. We're trying to figure out, is there some correlation or relationship between this, both qualitative and quantitative? Um, so first of all, I just want to quickly talk about what, I, what do I mean by these, by these things. Working memory capacity, very loosely put, again, I'm just diagram to orient myself. The dotted line here, you can think of as your memory. It's just all of it. Um, contrary to even how I thought about it, it's not different parts of the brain. It's just everything you remember is long-term memory. The way it's activated is what determines what's in long-term memory versus what's in short-term memory. So think about it as every piece of uh, like knowledge that you have, that you remember, is at some level of activation. If, you, if it crosses a certain baseline uh, level of activation, it's considered to be in short-term memory. So it's not a, like an actual another place in the brain that it goes to or anything like that. It's just levels of activation. So, but we weren't actually interested in short-term memory because, as it's defined, it's a very static thing. You're not doing anything with short-term memory or the knowledge in it. It's more a question of working memory, which is, think about short-term memory along with the central executive or the executive functions, saying that, yes, I have all of this activated thing in my short-term memory, but what do I choose to use? So there's a conscious sort of uh, or organization of what I just called to or brought to bear. Right? So that's what working memory actually is. It's short-term memory with the conscious choice of attention. What am I paying attention to? Uh, which is an executive function. So, so that's sort of loosely what, uh, how we're uh, talking about working memory. Now, that's working memory. Working memory capacity is the amount of information somebody can, an individual can hold at that time in that activated conscious state. And that differs for everybody. And that's actually a trainable skill. You can increase working memory capacity um, and all of those games that uh, sort of say it'll increase you better your memory or whatever, by and large what they're trying to do is improve working memory capacity as I found out. And one interesting thing about it is it's not domain specific. So increasing working memory capacity by doing crossword puzzles or playing chess or something like that does, has shown to have a crossover effect in anything else that you do. So it is not like a general, you have better working memory capacity for math versus music or English or something else. It's a very domain general, seemingly a very domain general kind of thing, which I thought it was encouraging, but um, the other thing that the literature from the cognitive psychology world that correlates very highly to working memory capacity is general fluid intelligence. Now, what do we mean by that? It is not intelligence quotients. It's not IQ tests. It's not talking about how intelligent somebody is. It is more about 
It's the ability to solve novel problems and adapt to new uh, situations. So what I when I read that, I said, why are you calling that general fluid intelligence? Because that doesn't make any sense. What I would see that more is along the lines of adaptability or transfer even in, in that sense, which is the term I'm choosing to use, uh, just because it makes more sense to me, at least for at this stage. Um, and now the tests, uh, so I, like I said, there's proven connections and correlations between working memory capacity and adaptability. Uh, for instance, the, this is not where I have the studies. Um, so, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at my notes here really quickly. Oh, the one big link between the two that come up is that executive function role. How consciously can you make the decision to what you're paying attention to? Um, that apparently connects both of these. And in, in some ways that makes sense to me because what is activated in your working memory and uh, what, how well can I adapt that to something else seem to be related or seems needs to be related for that matter. Um, the, another sort of important aspect of the way we test for both of these, so the tasks that you use, and this is where the connection to mathematical problem solving comes in pretty clearly for me, is uh, the reliance uh, that when you ask them to do the tasks for working memory versus uh, and for fluid intelligence or adaptability, you have to sort of, the individual has to go through this process. They have to discover a rule and then maintain that rule in their, with their attention while discovering a second rule and then sort of trying to assimilate both of them. And each, at each step, sort of consciously try to move forward and keep those rules and not allow distractions to come in. So for me, when I'm looking at students trying to prove things, in some ways that's very similar to me. It's, first of all, you have to identify a rule, a theorem, a definition, some, some deductive uh, piece of information that I know I need to use. But then I have to hold on to that and then try to assimilate something else. And it's all about trying to coordinate these multiple things that I'm trying to simultaneously pay attention to. Uh, and for me, that's a big part of how successful can you be in trying to teach somebody to prove something. It's how do you hold all these pieces of information at the same time and try to consciously move towards a goal. Um, now, logical ability has been tested in some ways. In um, 2007, uh, Nunez and her colleagues uh, did this longitudinal study where uh, they looked at six-year-olds and they measured their working memory capacity and they did tests to look at um, sort of their logical abilities, specifically in mathematics actually. So they were looking at tasks that involved um, sort of the inverse relationship with addition and subtraction. So the tasks were something like, if I give you a basket full of, let's say, seven apples, and then I add seven more to it, but then I take away seven, how many are left? So it's not actually about computation, it's more about, do they recognize if I have A plus B minus B, what does that relate, uh, result in? Or do, if I have A plus B, then I take away B minus one. What does that actually result in? Things like that. So tasks uh, that were designed more like that. They also looked at one-to-one -one and one-to-many correspondences for six-year-olds. So for instance, they were given two dolls. And um, let's say, uh, well, this was British. So it was one pence and two pence coins. And the tasks for the kids were, you need to distribute the money among the two dolls in a fair way. And what that means is they need to be able to buy the same number of toys. Uh, the kids were old enough, they controlled for, they knew the difference between one pence and two pence. Um, and they were trying to see how do they make that relationship. So like, and oh, the other uh, direction was doll A can only get one, you can only pay one pence to doll A and only pay two pence to doll B. But you still need the, so, uh, the equal number in the end so that they can buy the same toys with it. So it's the idea that one 
two one pence coins relate to one two pence coin, things like that. Uh, and they found that uh, one, so working memory capacity and adaptability actually correlates very highly to logical uh, sort of reasoning. But not only that, they were both really good predictors to at least mathematical performance 18 months later. Uh, so this was a longitudinal study. So that was study one. Study two, they based on that, they actually did interventions with uh, another set of six-year-olds where they actually trained them to increase working memory capacity or trained them specifically in logical, sort of increasing their logical abilities. And then, uh, sort of at least with quantitative performance metrics, see how, how well they did 18 months down the road. And as sort of expected, the people who had, the kids who had the working memory capacity training and logical, uh, sort of increasing their logical reasoning abilities performed well even sort of 18 months out. So there have been sort of basic things, uh, not basic, but things like that done. Similar things have been done with college students, except in a very, uh, so this was back in 1984, uh, where a, a big sample of college students were tested on how well they understood uh, simple logical uh, implications, if P then Q statements. Uh, so given, I think one of the tasks they used was, if the couch is soft, then it is Linda's couch. The couch is soft. Is it Linda's couch? Yes, no, or uh, you don't have enough information. So they were trying to see if they can actually make uh, correct logical inferences based on human information, and they would test the contrapositive, or the converse, or the inverse, and kind of see. Um, but that was a very frequency kind of study, just seeing how many math majors got this right, how many non-math majors got this right, uh, how many freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors sort of did. So what are we doing? Well, one of the things that uh, we're using is something called the Mathematical Logic Inventory, which uh, is pretty reason, recent. Uh, Kim Ha uh, Ra over at ASU and her colleague uh, in Korea, Dr. Lee, came up with this idea, uh, this survey instrument uh, that's validated to a certain extent. Look at, so they, it's full of statements like this. Um, F and G are functions from R and R, and you have this statement for all X and R, if x is less than 0, then f of x. It's a very typical if-then statement. And the task is to find equivalent statements, for instance, in this. There are um, other versions of it that say, find the opposite of this, things like that. Um, so, but one of the issues that we have with this is we can't present tasks like this to our participants. Because we have a sample size issue. Anytime we're looking at this kind of work or data, we're talking the n has to be in the hundreds. Uh, so finding 200 math majors who have had enough mathematics that they can make even sense of that statement is not an easy thing to do. So one of the things we have had to do is adapt instruments like this that hopefully test the same logical structure or maintain that same logical structure, but we have to change the mathematical content. So for instance, the same task, we adapt it to something like this. And there's a reason why it might read as complete nonsense. <coughs> For all gizmos, if it is orange, then it is fuzzy. Same idea, same structure of there's a quantifier with a universal quantifier, as in instead of if for all real numbers, we have for all gizmos. If you have some property on that each one of those real numbers, x is less than zero, if that gizmo is orange, then you draw some conclusion about it, then it is fuzzy. So why do gizmos and orange and fuzzy instead of saying something like, if it is raining, then you use an umbrella? So any guesses? Give me a chance to kind of break here for a second. It was a very concerted effort not to use sentences like that, like if it is raining, then we use an umbrella, as opposed to something like this. They might use their own, what you call it? I'm sorry? Like they might use their own, they have constructed logical 
Exactly. We don't want them to make. We want to. We want to at least, hopefully, reliably uh, have them use their just the knowledge of the structure of the rule or the statement as this is sort of given to them. It's said, here's a rule. Can you pick out the rules that are equivalent to this? And we don't want them to make any have any preconceived notions of, well, you know, yesterday it was raining, but I didn't use an umbrella, for instance. We don't want them to actually make that kind of a judgment call. So most of this, all actually not most, all of the statements are pure nonsense, but we want it to be. Um, so we do this, and the way it's sort of structured, so currently, and this is going on right now, the data collection is going on right now, so we have about 200 students, and where we get these 200 students, which was news to me, apparently, which is very easy to do, they're all Psych 101 students, um, and they do this for free, well, for course credit, but like we don't, they don't pay them. And so when when we first, when Kim and I first started talking about this, and she said, "Oh, 200 is easy," and that's a pretty nice size for a pilot study, which is what this is, a pilot study. And I was just so much cognitive dissonance. <laughs> 200, what? So um, what we do is when they come into the lab, we collect background. Well, when I say we, there's a huge group of graduate students who do this. Uh, uh, they do, they collect all kinds of background information about them. Their math background, which is important because we want to know uh, if they're, since Psych 101 students can be a freshman or can be a senior, can be a math major, cannot be a math major, have taken the intro to proof course, for instance, have not. So knowing that piece of information, all those pieces of information is useful for us because we need to be able to control and norm for that when we're looking at performance in some ways. So once they do that, they're given the logical instrument, which is the non-content based, like fuzzy gizmos, that stuff. But before that, and before every other sort of, they're trained, which is basically, this is all computer based. So uh, they're said for the next three or four questions, actually the computer will generate questions until they get to, uh, I think the number is about an 80% hit rate. So they're actually answering the questions correctly. And actually, if they never get to that after like 10 or 15 minutes, that person is not used in the study. They'll still go through all of the rest of the stuff, but that data is marked as they never reached a level where uh, you could reliably say that they're answering questions based on their understanding of what the questions are supposed to be asking them. So they do the training, they take the logical instrument, and this is the part, again, was surprising to me. This is all in one sitting. They start taking the training for the next test, uh, which is for the working memory capacity. And the types of uh, tests for these are, there are all these different span tests. For instance, they'll t in our study, they're taking two different tests, the reading span test and the numerical span test. And that's just to get, and they individually can give you a measure of working memory capacity, but the more number of tests we have, the better uh, and you av literally average the scores between them, the better measure of working memory capacity that you get. Uh, so for instance, the reading span, they showed a sentence, something very simple. Um, the, the clouds were very blue today, something like that, very simple statement. And then they're shown a bunch of gibberish, a bunch of letters in random, random order. And then immediately after that, they're asked a question about the sentence that was originally presented to them. So the goal there is they're presented with some rule or some information. How well can they hold that piece of information in the uh, sort of space of having a lot of other distractions and then actually answer something about it uh, towards the end? So that would be one sort of task, and they go through a bunch of those. And then we do one more thing with them, which is the adaptability, which is, is, I had taken this test before, it's called Raven's Adaptive Matrices. I didn't know why I had taken it, but it's, a lot of us probably have seen it, it's this grid, a three by three grid of different shapes in progressing in some pattern, and we have to fill out what, choose what the ninth shape would be. If anybody's ever taken a Mensa test or some kind of IQ, you see a lot of those things. And uh, that's Raven's adaptive, adaptive matrices test. It's by and large, you just 
looking for pattern recognitions. Um, there was a second test, but we decided not to use it just because we're talking. They're, by the end of this, they're in there for 90 minutes. Or, um, so, so there is certain fatigue, obviously. Now, what do we want to do with all this? is all quantitative work. So what happens? Where's the qualitative stuff come in? So one of the things that we are doing with this is once we have these quantitative measures, we can actually take these 200 people and profile them in certain ways. Uh, according to low to high working memory capacity, low to high uh, adaptability scores, low to high uh, how their performance with the logic instrument did, or uh, how they did on the logic instrument. And based on that, the idea is to form representative samples from each profile in some ways and to do more in-depth qualitative interviews with them um, and actually give them more task base in a task-based environment where Say, so let's try and solve this problem. Let's talk us through what are you paying, uh, what are you doing, why are you doing certain things. So more along the lines of what we, what I do on a more day-to-day -day basis, but we have more background, at least cognitive psychology sort of uh, information about them, and they're, it's more purposeful sampling of you are representative of a slightly larger group of people sort of thing. So that's where the... Uh, qualitative sort of profiling comes in at the end. That's sort of well down. We've just started collecting data on having people come in to take all these tests. So where is this all this leading? Because one of the challenges we had set out is to try and do this with a purpose as opposed to just doing it because it's cool, uh, which it is, at least I think so. Um, one of the things that is personally very kind of useful for me to think about is this notion of attention. Uh, what are we paying attention to? And so my core work is with relation to the interim proof course, for instance. So um, one of the big challenges for me teaching that course is students ask of this question of given a statement to prove, what, are they, what should they pay attention to? What is useful information? Where does that first step come from? This, the magic first step. Like, why did you even choose to do that? So this question of attention is very sort of important to me. And the more I can try and understand how actual processing works in terms of attention, and if there is something to, that we can do as far as an intervention that even marginally improves our ability to pay attention to specific things in a better way, which may or may not have anything to do with the actual mathematics. That's a useful bit of information for me as an instructor. Uh, that's one thing. The, so this, and also that's uh, sort of the working memory adaptability side of it. But the logical, inf uh, the inference part is also sort of important. So part of my intro to proof course, they go through truth tables, for instance. We talk about structures of logical implications, for instance. However, there is another way to approach logical inference that has nothing to do with formal structure. Um, to actually have them work with rules of logic without actually imposing structure on it. And that's how a lot of the uh, training to improve logical inferences sort of work. It's given this rule, can we train ourselves to better stick to that rule? Which again, has nothing to do with looking at the structure of the statement, but it's just, can we operationalize things a little better? Well, if we can see, again, if there's a correlation between logical inference and working memory, as there seems to be, as the data, uh, at least with the, at the elementary level, seems to suggest, again, as an instructor, that's a useful piece of information for me, because that provides me a different instructional path to go rather than, because for instance, truth tables are probably one of the things that every single one of my students say, I don't get it. Like why, I understand I can fill in the T's and F's and follow rules, but I don't understand how that actually relates to what I'm doing as far as if I'm proving this sequence is converging somehow. How does that even fit in? So if there's a better way, better way, I want to know about it. There's also a slightly practical aspect to this. All of this started as a side, side hobby, but there is actually, funding agencies are calling for more work like this. For instance, the NSF uh, has 
recently, in the last 18 months, released something called the NSF Brain Initiative. That's a massive undertaking by them uh, across multiple uh, directorates. Uh, but one of the things that, uh, that is the main sort of goal for the, uh, the Brain Initiative is to do this kind of high-risk, high-reward work, which has traditionally been in the realm of the NSF Beager projects, uh, but to do it in a very interdisciplinary kind of the kind of work that, so for instance, Kim and I are doing. So there's a lot of support from both the university level and at sort of the funding agency level uh, to try and explore, does this, can this lead somewhere? So it happens to be a sort of a nice little perk to what started off again as a sort of side project. But I'll stop there because it's close to four. Um, and again, I'm sorry if this seemed a little haphazard because this was the last 24 hours. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. I welcome any kind of comments, criticisms, concerns that people might have because that's another reason I'm here. So. I know there's time after this too, right? So, um, it's my kind of crowd. Mm -hmm. I can ask a question. <laughs> so you're you're saying something about how there's a correlation between the working load for the memory <coughs> and the logical inferences. I'm guessing that if the working memory is higher than the logical inferences, it's more difficult for your student to make logical inferences. Or mm -mm. if they're making, if the working memory is working harder than so the logical inferences. So the data, uh -huh. the limited data that there is, like this that Nunez study that I talked about, uh, seems to suggest that higher the working memory capacity, mm -hmm. the more or the better students seem to perform in a long-term setting with, uh, well, there's a higher correlation between the work, high working memory capacity and high performance in logical inferences tasks. And it's also correlated to uh, mathematics performance down the road. Okay. So it's a sort of a positive correlation. Right, okay. The way that works. So I was thinking about it in the sense of like, does that mean that if someone doesn't have this high of a working memory, that we should be giving them tasks that have like lower cognitive lower demand. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is going to be a favorite answer of mine. I don't know. Okay. And here's the thing: I don't. That is not the conclusion I want to draw from this, and I don't right. think that's the that's a useful conclusion to draw from this, because the I think one as a educator and as a qualitative researcher primarily, my first indication of profiling in some ways or my reaction to putting people on this continuum of say high to low working memory capacity. My first reaction is kind of being defensive about it. It's like I don't want to profile the student, my students that way because I don't want things like that to happen where the people on the lower end of the scale you just assume that they can't do the work, so we don't give them the challenge of doing challenging problems. Mm -hmm. And that's how I first approached it, which is why none of this really made any sense for me to do. And if I thought that way, I wouldn't be doing this. The way I think, I choose to think about it, and I think the more useful way to think about this is having a judge of working memory capacity is not meant to um, group students and give them different instructional out, like uh, interventions in some way. Mm. It's to try and understand that, for instance, if we can work with students as a whole, and my class as a whole, in trying to do have them do tasks that uh, may lead to higher working memory capacity, that's a universal thing that I, uh, that the students can do. It's not meant for just the people who are at the lower end of the scale. It's, the correlation is not, doesn't uh, say that only the people with lower, at the lower end have a high correlation by increasing it or anything like that. Okay. These are not static pieces of uh, 
sort of information, I suppose, in some ways. So it is about uniformity to me mm -hmm. uh, in terms of intervention. Because my goal is to be able to challenge everybody with using tasks that are, um, of course, they're not ever going to be equally challenging to everybody. And I don't really want them to be equally challenging to everybody, I suppose. But I don't want them to be either distracted or inhibited in, in a way that can be helped by, a, by an intervention, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not about tracking or separating students. Right. Uh, I don't know. It's not the most coherent answer. But, uh, but it is a very quick reaction that even, even I have when I think about doing this kind of work. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I figured that wasn't your goal. I was just yeah, I mean, it's a useful, it's a, it's a natural and I think important question to ask. Well, what's interesting is also, personally for me, uh, so a little anecdote. In 2016, and ICME and Hamburg and the second ZDM special issue came out. The editors of ZDM held these three-day um, panel discussions. Uh, talking about trying to invite the people who wrote the articles and talk to math educators as much because the people who wrote the articles were predominantly neuroscientists and cognitive psychologists who have nothing to do with math education at all. Mm -hmm. um, so the goal was to take them to or have that venue of a math edu international math education conference and try to have those two groups of people talk. So I went to every single one of those panel discussions, and frankly, I was disappointed in the general reaction of my math ed community uh, in those panel discussions. For instance, that the def and that's where I this was where I was sort of still on the fence of this is something I want to do, and you know, was, the general type of questions were. Can, asking the, somebody asking the panel, can you give me one tangible result that you have learned that I can use with my students in my class? And I remember this particular uh, res uh, researcher stood up and gave the answer of, so for instance, with children with counting, uh, perhaps, and he was German, so he actually said, in Germany, uh, in primary school, one of the things that the teachers are sometimes taught is to try and get the students away from counting on their fingers. Uh, because apparently it's not it's not the best thing. It's seen as a crutch that you want them to be trying to think about it more like in their head. And he said research has sort of uh, multiple studies have definitively shown that counting on fingers is not meant to be a crutch. Like students don't children don't use it that way. They might continue to do this action, but they're not actually counting. Thing. It's just a, a way to trigger some processes uh, that helps them do better mm -hmm. longitudinally. So his it's like so by and large, neuroscientists say, don't stop kids from doing that because it's not doing what we think it's doing as far as inhibiting <coughs> them from moving forward. Mm -hmm. Which I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. It was that was just. The reaction in the room with that was so downright hostile, uh, and I was not terribly, I guess, happy or proud to be part of the community that had a reaction like that from a field that is not ours, but I think has still useful information that we can learn from. Just like they have stuff that we they can learn from us, for instance. So that's one of the things that I want to happen with work like this. Um, so that actually led me to try to be more critical about my first reaction to thinking about what does data like this tell us mm -hmm. and what we do with data like this. So, I mean, it's an important question. It's just, I guess, a different way of perhaps looking at the answer. Yeah. So. Um, what kind of task would actually help someone build their working memory capacity? Um, so, <laughs> there are a lot of different uh, caveat I should have, I mean, I sort of gave it at the beginning of all this. This is not at all my field, right? So this is sort of, take my answer with the biggest grain of salt you can find. The 
But from my understanding and my conversations with my colleagues who do think about this, um, there are different ways you could do it. So for instance, there are informal ways, uh, like for instance, they talked about trying kids to solve Sudoku puzzles, for instance, as simple as just a three by three grid and you know just nine numbers and trying to, for them to figure that out. That helps in, uh, improve working memory capacity. So something as simple as puzzles might do it. Um, there are tasks and series of tasks that are apparently designed to do very specific things, um, like for instance, and they're more specialized. So there's a pretty famous set of tasks that involve chess um, and movements of especially the knight um, that apparently have correlated pretty highly with increasing working memory capacity. Um, that obviously is a little harder to do because first you have to teach. There's basic rules of that that system that you have to teach somebody. So um, it doesn't have to be mathematical. Is sort of my point. Um, the it's a big business out there too. I mean, there are tons of uh, websites and apps that you can buy or download that purport to say that you improve your memory and. The general theme seems to be anything that puts you in that sort of problem solving space more consistently helps. So, I guess do more Sudoku puzzles. <laughs> it's frustrating to me because I don't like them. I can stick to the chess side. But. Do you have one more question if you have one? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm wondering how do you see the, the future of this work in particularly method education in terms of practical ways like uh, I think it requires some equipment to do this research mm -hmm. and also in terms of like dissemination or publishing this work in method journals like how do you see the future of I mean so there's precedent here right uh, for instance so Andy Norton has done work with uh, fMRIs and stuff that has been published in our MathEd journals. Uh, more recently, Jeremy actually looked at um, proof comprehension with mathematicians in terms of eye tracking software, for instance. Um, so just looking at mathematicians were given proofs and undergraduates, I, or, uh, I forget the populations, but I know mathematicians were part of it, were given proofs they weren't uh, familiar with and they were wearing eye tracking uh, hardware that, what are they paying attention to while they're reading things? Um, and there's a very noticeable difference between apparently how mathematicians read a proof as opposed to uh, how more novice uh, doers of mathematics, I guess, would read a proof. As in, mathematicians were sort of all over the place. They were looking at more, the argument more as a holistic structure, as opposed to perhaps a more linear way of reading a proof. I'd read this statement first, then go to the next one, then go to the next one. So there's a pattern. So um, there is precedent uh, in our purely map, like MathEd specific journals, as far as publishing goes. I'll let you know in the next year or so how other <laughs> MathEd journals might take this kind of work. We are publishing one on TME next, next issue about Nero. <laughs> Yes, as and, and these things. Yeah, and which is good to kind of see. And this is what's in some ways encouraging is that this kind of work is done a lot more internationally than in the states. So, for instance, Sweden and Germany have been doing working in this intersection of math ed and uh, neuroscience, for instance, for a while now. So, a lot of the work that's in the ZDM. Uh, journals are f European work. Um, very little of it is sort of in this country. So it's going to places like ICME broadens that view of what happens in math ed is not just a local in our country kind of thing. It's there's a lot of stuff to be uh, sort of just the fact that journals like ZDM chose to do multiple special issues on uh, things like this means that there is an audience for it. At least that's what I think. Yeah. 
let's thank our speaker one more time. And, we'll like you. and for those of you still interested in speaking with him, he'll be down uh, in 111J for the next bit of time. <laughs> I don't remember exactly. <laughs> you got to improve your working memory. <laughs> <laughs>